really more of a talk with questions and search for answers. The answers that I have are not as good as I wish they, they could be. So maybe people can help me out a little bit. And it's very high level, very conceptual, I hope. Not a lot of technical details. So, and this is joint work with my student, Matteo Campanelli. OK. So let me tell you what the model is. Um, I'm going to talk about verifiable computation in a model in which the adversary is not malicious, but rather an irrational entity. And by that, I mean that the adversary is only interested in maximizing a well-defined utility function that is defined inside the protocol. So, and our results, which I'll, you know, described better in the, in the talk, we started from this notion of rational proof that uh, Silvio Micali and Pablo Azar introduced a couple of years ago a stock in which, and so we started from that model, which was a model of a standalone protocol in which one computation is outsourced from a client to a server. And we sort of extended the model. Uh, we were motivated by the problem of uh, vol volunteer computations, stuff like protein folding or SETI at home. And actually, this, this started that I wanted my student to implement a volunteer computation client based on rational proofs. And as he started working on that, he, he started noticing this problem. And the problem is a problem which we have a s source of many problems that have to be outsourced. And now we wanted to make sure that the notion of rational proof was robust enough to deal with the case in which uh, providing the correct results on all the computation would be the actual rational strategy. And we ended up showing that some of the known rational proofs, according to the definition of Mikali and Azar, Azar and Mikali, do not satisfy our notion of sequential composability, which I hope is the correct one. And so then we present a new rational proof protocol. And this is the part where I wish our results were better, because it only works for certain function and for certain, uh, for certain stuff. It's not as general as I hope it was going to be. So let's, let's talk about rational proofs. Uh, this, it's an interactive proof between a prover and a verifier. The input is a function, f, and a value, x. And at the end of the, uh, the protocol, the prover provides the verifier with a value, y. And the verifier pays the prover with a randomized reward, which is a function of the transcript of the conversation between the two, the two of them. The crucial property of rational proofs is that this reward, this reward should be maximized in expectation when the prover provides the correct result. If the prover is a rational entity, therefore, he will only uh, do the right stuff, always compute correctly. The most attractive feature of rational proof is that they're very, very simple. Um, Mikhail and Azar show that there's a one round proof for the whole class of, P, of PP, and a constant round proof for the counting hierarchy. And here we're talking about proofs in which we have an all-powerful prover, of course, to deal with such a large complexity class and a polynomial time verifier. This is the original notion of interactive proof with an infinitely powerful prover and a polytime, polytime verifier. Of course, yeah? Who computes the, the... The infinitely powerful prover. No, who computes the reward? You said it's the right... The verifier. The verifier. The, the reward is polynomial time, polynomial time computable. Did he trust him that he chose the randomness correctly, or does he also? The verifier is honest. It's not like zero knowledge in which you have a malicious verifier. Here, here security is defined only in. Like that one of the, reward. the verifier is honest in this model. That's 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 outside the, the scope of the. Yeah. Then you, if if the if the verifier aborts, then you code this in Hawk and you'll be. She will be penalized. Yeah. Maybe not aborts, but choose the randomness in the right. Right. Yeah. 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 The very, in this case, the, in in this entire setting, the verifier is honest. Okay. We are interested in a efficient scenario in which we have a polynomial time computation, and if C is the complexity of computing this function, we would like to have a prover which is pretty much the complexity of computing the function, and a verifier, which is a lot faster than computing the function. 
And Azar and Mikali were aware that that's actually the application you want to look at. And they had a, a subsequent paper in which they present a very efficient verifier, a verifier that actually doesn't even read the, the input, it's sublinear, it actually runs only log time. And they present a cost around protocol for uniform, you need, you need your circuit to be uniform because the verifier needs to be able to, in log time, need to be able to access parts of the circuit and for threshold circuits. And this is possible, there was a work by, I don't know if Alon is here, Alon and some of his co-authors uh, co in which they extend this to actually log depth circuits if you allow, if you allow the verifier to be polylog rather than log. Okay. Let me briefly show you how the, the threshold product of, of the Mikali Azar uh, paper works. So just for simplicity, we have a single threshold gate with n inputs, and this threshold gate evaluates to one if at least k of the inputs are one, okay? So what does the prover does? The prover pays, reads the inputs, and then announce a number m tilde of input bits that are equal to one. So it's gonna tell the verifier there are this many inputs that are one. So, and this number m tilde define a probability, p tilde, which is the probability that if you choose a random bit, uh, that b will be one. This is the probability claimed by the prover to be the case, okay? So what does the verifier does? The verifier says, okay, you're telling me that's the number one, so if the number one is bigger than k, I'm gonna set my output to one, otherwise I'm gonna set it to zero. And then to compute the reward, the verifier selects a random input, a random, yeah, a random input in, among the n inputs, and look at the input bit b, which is the value xi, the input xi. And then here's where um, they use this notion from prediction uh, theory. It's, it's a, it comes from economics. It's something that is used to reward um, uh, weather prediction and uh, stock market prediction. It's called, uh, there are several that are called scoring rules, and they use Breyer's rule. And, the, and Breyer, these rules are a way to measure, to reward how well you announce a certain distribution. So think of this protocol as the prover is announcing a distribution, which is p tilde, right? The prover is telling you, if you select a random bit among these n bits, the probability you get one it should be p tilde. That's exactly what you're gonna do. You're gonna go and select an input bit. And you would expect it to be one with probability p tilde. And this is the amount of money that you're gonna pay. It's a function of the p tilde that was announced in number one, or the, or the bit one or the bit zero that you found. And so what's the expectation of, um, the, of the reward? The expectation of the reward is this one, where instead of p tilde, there's the real probability p that uh, the bit that you selected would be one or zero, right? It turns out that it's, it's not difficult to see that this value is maximized when the p tilde that is announced is equal to p. Okay? Yeah? So the difference between uh, when the prover is lying and when it's not is exponentially small or it's No, I, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. In this case, it's not. It's uh, the inverse of a polynomial. Okay. So, okay, this is the, this is the protocol. No matter what the prover announced, the prover gets some money. The, the, the trick is that this money in expectation is higher when the proof says the truth. Okay. Let me briefly say something. I'm talking about the reward. What about the profit of the prover, right? There's a cost involved in computing this function. So the profit, oops, the profit of the prover is the reward that he gets minus the cost of the function. Well, consider a lazy prover which invests very little effort and yes, it gets paid, right? So what we want, we want the profit to be maximized, right? So you want R minus C to be bigger than R tilde minus C tilde. So it is sufficient to require that R minus R tilde is bigger than C, which means you gotta look at the, what Alessandro was saying, the reward gap. The reward gap is the, sm the smallest gap between the, max, the, the reward that the, the, the honest prover gets 
and the reward by a dishonest prover. And if you call that delta, if you multiply your rewards by a factor of c times delta, then your, uh, this is always true, because our matter R tilde is going to be c times delta, c divided by delta times delta, and so it's always going to be bigger than c, okay? So in, and if delta is one over a polynomial, your nothing is going, nothing is becoming exponential, and so we're all fine, right? In particular, in the previous protocol, the original reward is always a number between 0 and 2. It's not hard to see that the, the delta is actually, the reward gap is 1 over n squared. So if I announce, instead of announcing the right number, I announce the right number minus 1, which is really what gets you closer, you're going to get a reward which is, in, in expectation, 1 over n squared smaller. Okay? And that means that if you scale your rewards by, oops, again, by a factor of n cubed, you're fine. Okay, but this is in the one time case. Okay, uh, yeah. I'm still a little confused. Uh, so, computational cost. So, so it's, you know, my, my, my instinct when I look at this is to say, you know, if, 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 if I'm going to be paying this much, I might as well do the computation myself. If computation costs me the same thing, it costs you. Right. So, uh, so it, assumption that we have very well, this is uh, right. So that that's that's the whole com cloud computing paradigm is is uh, predicated on that. That what it, what it costs Amazon to provide me with, to compute this function is all what it costs me to compute this function. Right. right. Our gap is not an arbitrary polynomial. It, it's, it's no, like but this is this is this this gap is the gap between what the what the the honest prover gets right, and the dishonest prover. By you know the sen squared factor, right? Right. In this case. Okay, but this is the cost for the server. It's not the cost for me. Okay. So, okay. okay. Yeah, it will. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's put that aside for a minute. Okay. So, but he, let me give you an example of a lazy prover. For example, in in this protocol, consider a prover that answers a random, which takes. It's a constant strategy, constant cost strategy. Well, if you take the expected, if you take an expectation of, over the Breyer rule that I showed you before, it turns out that this is the value in expectation that a random prover is going to get, okay? Which is always bigger than one. Remember that the honest prover always earns a most two. So what's going to happen? Does anybody see a problem at this point? What? If you do it multiple times, what's going to happen? So uh, if already on two executions, the random prover is going to earn more than the honest prover. So the honest prover is computing, 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 because he has to read at least 10 inputs to do the, 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 right, the right word, the right job. But the bad prover is answering at random, and he's collecting more money just by, by answering. In other words, if there is a large number of computation, exactly, the volunteer computation, and we have provers who are vying to solve these problems as fast as they can, which is exactly what happens in SETI at home or the protein folding, then if an honest prover takes on time to solve this problem and earns $2, but the random prover takes one and earns $1, uh, more than one dollar, in the time they take the bonus to solve one problem, the, the dishonest prover is going to solve many, is going to earn more money. In other words, a sloppy, fast answer is the rational strategy rather than the slow, correct one. Okay? So, scaling, right? what? This is independent of scaling. And this is independent of scaling, exactly. I can scale my, my, my reward by whatever multiplicative factor, this is still going to be a problem. Scaling will help for one. For one, scaling helps to somehow whatever you want to call the cost, as Adam is, you know, sort of questioning, you know, but you can always scale it to make sure that there is a positive profit. But then you're going to be stuck with this problem. To be honest, this is not was not in the. To be fair to the to the regional authors, this was not in their model. So it's not like a problem with their model. It's a problem with the model, not a problem with the solution. Okay. So, okay, so here is a first attempt to define what we want formally. What I would like to have is, so 
informally, what do I want? Do I want that if, if I'm the honest prover and I invest this much computation, and then there is a dishonest prover who is going to invest less computation than me, that dishonest prover should earn less money than I do. Okay? So that's, that's informally my goal. Okay? So one way to do that is to say, okay, a rational proof is for a function f is sequentially composable if for every prover p tilde and every sequence of input, if computing on cx, the honest prover costs this much, but the dishonest prover is going to work for less, then the reward that the honest prover gets should be bigger than the reward that the dishonest prover gets. Okay, this, okay, actually, there's a, anybody sees a problem with this? It's such a very simple problem. And the problem here is that I'm saying that this is true for every sequence of inputs, and this is not going to be possible. There could be a prover who has some solutions already are wired for a particular input, and it's going to give me the correct result, but it's going to do no work. So that's, I, can't, I can't get that. So what you need to do, you need to introduce a notion of distribution over the inputs, and you know, later we're going to make the assumption that over the distribution of the inputs, the only way you can get the correct result is by doing all the work. Okay? So that's, and now if you, if you make this notion of looking at randomly chosen input over according to a certain distribution, now that at least the definition makes, I hope makes sense. Okay, so, so here's the definition, remember the definition. Definition says that if you invest less cost, Less work, then you should earn less money. Okay? C tilde is, uh, hmm? uh, C -tilde is required to be stateless here, so you cannot like, keep state. You cannot say that's, that's part, right. Well, you can make the definition of the way you want, and then in your protocol, you're gonna, we're going to make an assumption that it doesn't keep state. For example, if you compute a circuit on a certain input, you wouldn't be able to remember what you computed when you're going to compute again. It's apparent that he just kind of starts from scratch. Right, exactly. That, 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 that's a big kind of worms that I'm still confused myself on how to sort of do all of that. But I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So here, I'll give you two sufficient conditions. And the first one is actually very interesting. So if, um, if the reward of the honest prover is fixed, and, the co and there is an upper bound on the cost, which of course there is, then what you really want is that the reward that the honest, the dishonest prover receives in this, in this execution, the fraction of the reward that the dishonest prover receives should be smaller than the fraction of the cost that he invested in the computation, okay? And it's actually not that difficult to prove that if this is true, then the definition is satisfied. And a simpler way to state the sufficient condition is that if the reward is either R or zero, Think of a protocol in which I do a minimal check to verify that you're giving me the, result, the correct result. And if something goes wrong, I won't pay you. But if something is right, I will pay you. Then in the case that reward is either R or zero, then P tilde is the probability that you, that you receive the full reward, then, then clearly that's what you need, that this probability is less than the, the fraction of the cost. So, the interesting thing about this definition is that you need to create a relationship between the reward and the amount of work, which was completely absent in the, in the previous work. And actually, there is one work which I'll mention in the next slide. But in this slide, actually, there is a protocol in the original paper by Azar and Mikali that they only consider in the standalone model, they'll actually satisfy this definition. And there's a, mo a solution in the PCP model. What I mean by the PCP model is that the prover is going to write down a proof, a potentially long proof that the verifier cannot handle, and put it somewhere like in a trusted memory location, and then the verifier is just going to look at a couple of location in that proof. Okay? So this works actually for any polynomial time computation. Look at the circuit computing the function. And then on, on input x, the prover writes down the entire circuit, and then the verifier can just choose one gate at random. Okay? If that gate is correct, the verifier pays r, otherwise the verifier pays zero. Okay? Clearly, on expectation, you want to write the correct proof, because there's a probability 1 over s that are gonna, that are gonna catch you, right? So, and, where is it? Okay. And you can prove that if you assume a cost model in which 
basically the prover pays one to compute and write down the gate, then the probability of surviving and getting the reward even when I am giving you a false result is exactly the number of correct gates that you wrote divided the total number of gates, right? And that's exactly, if you assume that that's, you pay one for every correct gate that you compute and write down, that's exactly the, the same ratio, so you're fine. So even if they were looking only at the standalone, this, this solution actually works also for sequentially composable, although it really is kind of dependent on, on the cost model that you're using. For example, for a cost model in which you're paying one, do, one unit of cost to compute the gate and another unit of cost to write it down, that actually doesn't work anymore because the constant factors are getting in the way. Okay. So there was another paper, and Anna and Al Coco uh, are here somewhere. Uh, uh, they also consider this problem, though with different definition and diff slightly different model. And here what they, and this only works when you have a really large number of problems. And here what basically I'm paraphrasing their solution here is look at the, you have all this problem, batch them in, in set of K. Choose a parameter K, okay? And instead of paying the prover every time the prover does a computation, just wait for the prover to solve K of them. When you get the result of this K computation, take one at random and recompute it yourself, okay? And now, if, if the result is correct, then you're gonna pay all K computation, otherwise you're gonna pay zero, okay? Now this also works because here you need to make an assumption, and I skipped this one. You need to make an assumption, and this is what you're saying, you don't keep state and all of that, that the only way you can compute your function is by actually computing it, okay? On this input distribution, the only way you can get the correct result is only if you, compute, if you run the actual algorithm. There's no other better way to do it, okay? So in that case, the amount of work that you do to return m tilde correct values is m tilde little c, where c is the cost of one execution. And so the probability that you get the reward, even when you're behaving correctly, again, is less than the ratio of your cost divided by the total cost. However, this requires your k, the number of problems, to be large enough if you want to keep this very far efficient, right? So that the cost of computing f1s should be amortized over your K execution. Otherwise, the, the verifier is basically recomputing F, and there is no advantage in computing it herself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens to the model where the verifier with very small probability checks the work, otherwise just this is, this is it. This is it. That's but it. If, but, if, but if it catches the prover cheating, then the prover has to basically go minecraft and pay him. So that's what I'm saying. I'm paraphrasing here, okay? This is exactly, the, the, their protocol actually has this sort of like negative rewards in which I pay you every time, and then there's a part of it that is kept in escrow, and then if I ever catch you uh, cheating, I'm going to assess you a negative reward. But again, because I'm recomputing the thing myself, you need this number K of problems to be large enough to amortize the complexity. If you still want your verify to be little O of the original computation, okay? I sort of simplify their approach by saying, instead of introducing negative rewards and escrow and all of that, I just either pay you all of them or don't pay it, or even if you, if, but just by checking one of them, okay? So, so what we came up, and this is the part that is, to me at least, not as satisfactory as I would like it to be, is a protocol that is basically inter an interactive version of the PCP uh, protocol of Azari and Mikali. So you start with an arithmetic, and this works for an arithmetic circuit. So you start with an arithmetic circuit of depth D, and what the prover does, sends the app, and the two, and let's assume that it's bound to FNE, and says, says two, and he sends the app and the two inputs of the gate. And what the verifier does, the verifier checks that the gate is correct, and then it recurses on one of the two inputs at random on the sub-circuit that computes that input. <laughs> okay? So you give me, the prover gives me the result of the computation, and it tells me the upper gate was, the two inputs of the upper gates were 
in zero and in one. And I said, okay, I checked that. If the check fails, I don't, I'm not gonna pay you. I'm gonna pay you zero. And then I'm gonna select one of these two inputs at random and I recurse the protocol on the subcircuit. Okay? So this is the protocol. You can see that, first of all, this protocol is a standalone rational proof for log depth circuits, and that's why, because the probability of obtaining the reward, even when giving an incorrect result, can be, you can show that it's one minus two to the minus d, and so it's logarithmic. The gap is logarithmic when d is log. The, the reason is that p tilde, once I, if I give an incorrect result, then the, 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 the dishonest prover can compute one subcircuits correctly and give me one correct result and one incorrect result, and then I hope that I'm gonna select the correct one. So with probability a half at every level, he's gonna survive. So, probability a half, so the, the probability that I'm gonna detect them is only gonna be two to the minus d, okay? Because then at the last level, I'm gonna check the inputs and I'm gonna, okay? Okay, the sequential composability relies again on this assumption that the only way you can compute the right value of a wire is by computing the subcircuits that leads to that wire, okay? Then, and here is, then we need to have the circuit to have a, 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 a two property. The first one is, the circuit, well, it's what we call a regular circuit. It, basically what it means is that, yeah. Why can't you use a real PCP? I, I missed something. Why can't the prover just give you a real PCP? Because the, 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 the verifier may not be able to handle the entire PCP. You, in the PCP model, you can, but you need to have, what do we do in, 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 we do a commitment, right? We do Merkle on the PCP. To have a log verifier, we do Merkle, right? You can do crypto. I'm trying to do, maybe I should have said it at the beginning. I, I don't want to do crypto, otherwise I'll do snarks, okay? This is all information theoretic. In fact, and this is not in my, in fact, a very good question, which also we've been working on, is to de 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 define and design a notion of rational commitment. Meaning something which I commit to a value and I release the correct value that I committed, not because I'm bound by a cryptographic condition, but I'm bound by maximizing my utility. If I had that, then I could just take the PCP protocol and use that. So this works, again, for log depth circuits, which have some, some this, what we call a regular circuit, meaning that basically every sub-circuit looks the same. And, and, in, and then you need, remember, you need that this probability, this is the probability of success. Remember, this probability of success for the prover should be less than C tilde divided by C. I think I left this somewhere else. So remember, this is the condition that I need. So a level one, this is a half. That means you need to compute level one of the circuit. You need to do a half of the work. To a level two, it would be three quarters. So it means you have to do three quarters of the work. Basically, the, 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 the number of, of gates has to double at every, at least double at every level. And one example of this is the circuit that computes one FFT coefficient. And that sort of made us happy because FFT is one of the protocols that are used a lot in this volunteer computations. And you can improve things somehow by iterating the protocol R times and reducing the probability of error to, to this, but then the complexity of the verifier will always increase. Uh, you can also use a mixed strategy. Uh, for example, here, I'll just exemplify on, on the circuit that given the point representation of a degree n minus one polynomial, it is the value of the polynomial on another point. This circuit is basically an FFF, FFT circuit that goes from the point to the coefficient representation and then an evaluation circuit that brings it down to the actual, actual value. In this case, and you guess what happens is that you you can either put yourself in a condition. Let, let me see. Okay. You can either use the check by re-execution in in Anna's paper on at least every log n executions, and for less than log n execution, then you can prove that our strategy works, even if your protocol is now much deeper than a log n. I mean. It's one log n, okay? 
So, so let me just summarize. So what we do, so uh, we define this notion of sequential composability, and we want to make a goal that answer it correctly always is the rational strategy. And we prove that some rational probability problem do not satisfy the definition of what others do, and we present a new protocol that achieves it for certain bounded death circuits. <laughs> now, what is the problem? There are many problems. One, for example, even in the standalone case, we don't have a rational proof for any polynomial time computable function. We have the PCP uh, uh, protocol, but not a information theoretic, doesn't use cryptography protocol that works for any polynomial time computable function. A better sequentially composable protocol that would work for any bounded death circuit, not this weird circuit that we sort of came up with. And also other example of interesting problems, we were just stuck with FFT because in a way that's all we cared, that are circuits that can be used with, with our protocol. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Rosario.